And how much of that has played out in your own mind in making your this discovery about these planets that don't seem to fit with the stars that they're assigned to? I mean, obviously, you're, I read your paper. It's very observational, very technical. Mm-hmm. You make... You spend almost all of the effort trying to convince the reader that this is a valid observation. Essentially, there's not much time for theorizing about where this planet came from. Yeah. Do you do you secretly spend time theorizing in your mind about the story of these bizarre planets in a way that you might not be able to necessarily construct a peer-reviewed article about? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, the Z, the paper is a lot of, uh, yeah, we were looking for these sort of this population, looking for these planets in more of a statistical overview, trying to view the population. And then, yeah, it was having to spend a lot of the paper, a lot of the methods and the efforts was trying to yeah, rule out ways that these could not be real because, yeah, a lot of people expected them to not be real. So we needed to try and cover as many bases as we could with the data we had available to try and rule out as many possible scenarios for these not being planets as we could. Um, and I mean, that's half of finding planets is convincing yourself that it's not one of the many non-planet scenarios that can give you the same signal. Um, but yeah, and then while I was then, yeah, I was writing it up and I was chatting a little bit with some people about, well, how could we form these planets? They don't fit perfectly well into the paradigms. And then, yeah, I was think secretly thinking about, well, maybe this could be what it's coming from. And I think one of the, so there's. Can you share some of your secrets? Yeah, I can share some. (laughs) Off the record, off the record, just late (laughs) night. Not peer reviewed. You're you're very tired. You're tired. It's the end of the day. You you didn't know what you were saying. Yeah. So there's two main hurdles to forming these planets. Is based. The first is sort of the amount of material that's available in the protoplanetary disks. And then there's also a slight problem as well in that, if you have a lower mass star, the planetary cores actually form more slowly. And so people people thought, well, even if you could form it, the disk would be gone by the time and your planet would still be too small to be a giant. Uh, although in that second one, there's been some observations over the past few years of what people have started terming these Peter Pan disks, which are these sort of seem to be these very old, very long lived gas rich disks. So whereas I was saying most disks, we expect them to only last for 10 million years. I think there was an observation of a Peter Pan disk. So this disk that's still there, still rich in gas around the star that's nearly 50 million years old, 50, 55 million years old. And I think there's actually a lot of these disks have also been observed around these sort of 0.3, 0.4 solar mass stars. And so one of my theories is that potentially these it's these sort of extreme long-lived disks that sort of persist for much longer than other uh pro-planetary disks and so therefore potentially have a slightly different environment could be where these sort of very rare planets these planets with these small stars maybe this is at least one of the places where they're forming and how you're being able to build up this enough of this planet and this core and accrete the gas onto the planet um, and perhaps the method, the formation does happen much slowly as people thought it would, but you have these environments where you can have that much slower formation and still form that giant planet. And potentially there's a link there into, into how these planets could be forming. How, how much material is in the protoplanetary disk versus the star itself? Because we're talking about gas giants that are 40% of the size of the star. Yeah, so the yeah, so again that's so the these giant planets there they can be sort of yeah, the ones we're looking at, they're about uh in terms of radius, they're about twenty-five percent, I think, the radius, because you have a point four you have a point four solar mass star or it's about point four solar radii as well, roughly. And I think one Jupiter radius is about ten percent of the radius of the sun. So you have about 0.1 solar radii for one Jupiter radius. Um, but then I can't remember the numbers off my head, but I think the mass of the planet is actually much, much less mm. than that same weight. And like the mass ratio is still sort of closer to the order of 
sort of a few percent um these planets still but the radii are much similar um but i think even yeah again this is sort of again that limiting factor is sort of how well we understand protoplanetary disks and there's been some sort of thoughts and some observations that seem to put a upper limit of about 10 percent the mass of the star is the mass of the disk and it's sort of believe that once you go above this and it's sort of believe that this is roughly a cutoff for the size of these disks um but then even then because of these sort of streaming effects and all the material being lost people then think also well, maybe only about 10 percent of the disk mass can actually go into forming a planet so then you're left in a scenario where you based on current observations of disks and current understanding of how planet formation works people might argue you might think that only maybe you could form a planet that's sort of maybe only one percent of the mass of the central star um i think i've got that right <laughs> so yeah so there's sort of this levels that people think these and if you get a protoplanetary disk that gets much more massive than that then it sort of becomes unstable very quickly um and so there's sort of yeah there's this sort of that's basically yeah, the theories of how big your protoplanetary disk can be how much material you can have to form the star to form the planet what would it take for you to be able to publish a theory like that a, a peer-reviewed theory what would you have to could you do it would you have to collaborate with people who work on these discs specifically what yeah you know because I, I ran into this same problem i'm publishing a paper too right now and it's it, there's so many amazing conclusions that fall out of the work and I just wanted to cram them all into there, you know, like, oh my God, this can revolutionize the way we think about all of these different systems, you know, because it's a very fundamental yeah. mathematical material science paper, but the implications are enormous. And my advisor is kind of like, well, that's not our job, you know, like somebody else yeah. will have to follow that up and do all of the experiments to convince people that these possibilities actually play out in nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm always curious what that next level looks like from taking some extraordinary observation about nature to proposing a theory that people will actually entertain about it. Because just saying something doesn't seem to get you very far. <laughs> 